Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk to you about cross-linking mass spectrometry. I know JP yesterday um, presented it in general about uh, individual complexes, but I'm going to present more recent uh, technological and, uh, and biological development we've done towards cross-linking uh, protein complexes in inside cells and in situ. So, um, oops. okay, so the question is, why do you want to study protein interactions in, uh, in situ? I mean, I think for bacteria in particular, I think we have a pretty good, um, we have a pretty good description of the large soluble, uh, like stable protein complexes. So I call these the core complexes. Um, but we know that there's a whole, whole lot of proteins that interact with these, and there's also areas in the cell that aren't, aren't so soluble, such as the membrane or, or, uh, or things bound to DNA. And you also have your, um, uh, you know, your molecular crowding and, uh, and, and other, uh, other aspects that are very, very difficult to recapitulate uh, um, ex vivo. So ideally, we'd like to trap interactions inside the cell um, uh, before we study them. So uh, the other techniques that people have used is like um, APMS or cofractionation, but these all involve lysing the cell first, so um, interactions with the high off rates are lost. With cross-linking, you just add a cross-linker to the cell and you trap the, uh, the interactions. And then you can also not just map which proteins interact with each other, but you also have the topology because you know, you're, um, uh, you know what the, that these residues must have been nearby each other in the, in the cell when, you've, uh, when they've been cross-linked together. So I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the, the workflow. So you have a, a cross-linker. Um, cross-links are very simple. They're just uh, two reactive, um, uh, two, two reactive uh, ends with a spacer in the middle. So the reactive groups react with uh, um, uh, whatever residues they're specific for. Here is quite a standard crosslinker, DSS, which is reactive for NHS esters, or sorry, reactive, it's NHS esters reactive for lysines and um, uh, serine training and tyrosine also. Um, we tend, there's different chemistries you can put in the spacer, such as uh, an enrichable handle for pulling out the crosslinker or, um, or isotope labeling for quanti quantitative studies or cleavability to um, where it breaks inside the mass spectrometer for, to aid sequencing the peptides. Then you, um, this is the typical workflow is where you add your crosslinker to usually a purified complex as, um, as JP sh uh, showed yesterday. Then you digest your, um, uh, your, your protein mixture, and then you have a mixture of cross-linked peptides and linear peptides. So linear peptides are, are regular peptides that you get from a triptych digestion, and these represent your background, and they tend to be a lot more abundant than, um, than, uh, than the cross-linked peptides. So typically, people will, will enrich the cross-links by, um, by size, and do size exclusion chromatography, because they tend to be bigger than linear peptides, obviously, or, um, or by... Uh, cation exchange because they have um, uh, at low pH they have they have two positively charged uh, termini instead of instead of one um, and then they uh, then you acquire this in the mass spectrometer and you have a, a chimeric, chimeric spectra so you've got two peptides um, in, in one spectra that are linked together so the we've done a lot of work in database search so how to uh, deconvolve these then you do a uh, um, an FDR filter, so you, you see at what, uh, you filter your data for 1% uh, FDR, so you know 1% of them are wrong. And then uh, we've done a lot of work in visualization, and then you mod model building and hypothesis, hypothesis testing. So if you want to do this inside cells, uh, this, prevent, this presents brand new challenges. So we've, a lot of my work here during my postdoc was spent, um, was spent uh, um, addressing these, the, these challenges. So how to get crosslinkers inside the cells. This actually is fairly easy. The cells take them up um, uh, quite nicely. Then we were developing two-dimensional um, uh, fractionation. So this is, we were doing uh, uh, like high resolutions uh, cation exchange, and they were taking each of those fractions and doing anion exchange, or on the second dimension, separating by size. And then we were acquiring a lot of the, uh, um, uh, we were doing a lot of mass spec um, acquisitions. And then this presented also visualization challenges, and uh, which I won't go into today because I don't have time. Um, we also spent a lot of time working on um, on uh, false discovery rate um, filtering. This we discovered this was actually a big a big issue that the um, the uh, the algorithms and statistics we were using for individual complexes completely fell over when we uh, 
when we did um, large scale analysis. So I, we have a paper up in bioarchive about this. Hopefully it'll also be out soon in a journal. Um, so I want to talk about um, when, when we had this, this technical work done, I will talk about a project that we, uh, we worked on, and this was transcription, uh, studying transcription, translation, coupling, and mycoplasma pneumonia. So mycoplasma pneumonia is a very simple organism. Uh, these are people maybe aware of um, mycoplasma species in their cell culture, but pneumonia are, um, is a mycoplasma that lives in your lungs. It's, a, um, it's a, a parasite. It can only live there. It has only 707 uh, genes because most of its uh, biosynthetic capabilities have been uh, have been removed through um through evolution um and a lot of its ohms have been uh, have, have been studied you know the transcriptome metabolome etc um this is show how simple it is if you do a simple mass spec run with a you know um with a high-end mass spectrometer you get you detect 550 pro 549 proteins so it's very simple and uh, uh, people have used uh, this species or its cousins to do um, full models of cells and uh, and other um, and uh, Craig Venter is doing the minimal bacterial genome where he makes this even simpler by removing more genes. But amazingly, still 30% of its genes have unknown function. So um, we were particularly interested in transcription translation coupling. So my PhD lab, they had um, done pull downs in this species and shown that you pull down the RNA polymerase, you pull down the um, the ribosome and vice versa, but this we, they couldn't study this in um, uh, ex vivo. It just the whole thing falls apart when you break open the cell, which is not uh, unexpected considering the DNA and RNA and everything that's uh, um, that's required in this in this uh, in this complex. So in E. coli, people have proposed that um, that they were coupled via um, via NUSG. So this transcription factor NUSG, uh, transcription elongation factor, would bind to the RNA polymerase on one end and then bind to the ribosome on the other end. Uh, NUSA is also bound in this, um, in this complex. We know it binds the whole long genes, but it wasn't um, proposed that it was involved in the, in the coupling. Um, and then there was, this, there was a, um, a structure by Patrick Kramer, Patrick Kramer's lab a few years ago, where they stalled an RNA polymerase in, uh, in vitro, and then they've, um, they've added a ribosome. The ribosome ran along the uh, mRNA, and then you had this kind of stalled structure, which they called the espressome, this whole, whole structure, and proposed that this direct interaction was uh, what was happening inside cells. So we cross-linked our mycoplasma. So this is a native mycoplasma, and this is cross-linked with DSSO, so the cross-linker we used, which is very similar to the DSS I showed earlier. Um, and they're quite close to native uh, structure after cross-linking. So as you see with glutaraldehyde, they look much sicker. So these are, um, these are actually um, tomograms of the cells. Um, so then we, as I showed earlier, we do two-dimensional fractionation on the, um, on, the, on the peptides. And then we identified after 72 days, full days of mass spec analysis, uh, we, did, uh, we identified um, uh, almost 600 protein-protein interactions and in total 12,000 uh, unique residue pairs. So these are um, you know, lysine to lysine or lysine to serine or training or something like this. So, um, and we know that our cross-linker is, um, should cross-link uh, distances less than 30 angstroms from, uh, from C alpha to C alpha. So this just gives an overview of the data set. So um, most of the, well, just over half of the interactions we identified were known. So they'd been identified by pull-downs before, but almost half were unknown, which seemed concerning at first. But uh, a lot of these were just interactions of chaperones. And another uh, large chunk of these are membrane interactions. These are typically um, not, uh, um, not identified with pull downs, which require soluble interactions. This was, um, this was nice. And then here is the um, number of unique crosslinks per interaction. So this is if you have two proteins interacting, how many unique residue pairs did we have between them? And uh, um, this on uh, the known, so pyruvate dehydrogenase, for instance, had many, many links between its subunits. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to this NUSA2, um, which is that transcription elongation factor to ribosomal subunits that, that we saw. Um, so the, this is just our, our links mapped onto um, models, the so Swiss models from, um, um, from the uh, uh, from mycoplasma, because a lot of a lot of mycoplasma has no um, has no no structures solved directly of its of its complexes, 
and um, a lot of the, the majority of the crosslinks made uh, made sense. So for, uh, you see here on the um, ATP synthase, for instance, there's some over length links shown in red or almost over length shown in orange. But this is a flexible region of the of the ATP synthase. So we were quite content that the data um, made a lot of structural sense inside the cell. Um, we also identif identified interactions between uh, between uh, membrane proteins. These are uh, here in brown as the membrane passes. And uh, the RNA is Y, actually, the, they had a second subunit that wasn't identified um, before because its homology was weak, but we were able to identify it as this, um, this pr previously uncharacterized protein. Um, so this is the, the interaction network with, uh, with the chaperones removed. So it's a bit, a bit simplified. And uh, I see we had these membrane associated complexes, but we also had our RNA polymerase and a ribosome with interactions through NOS-A, which was unexpected because from the structures before, either we expected a direct interaction between the two or an interaction through NOS-G. Um, and this is a zoom in on that, uh, on, on that network. So you have the RNA polymerase here with the, uh, the binders. Um, we had also some novel binders of RNA polymerase that were previously unknown, these uncharacterized proteins, which we did um, bacterial two hybrids and confirmed that they actually bound the, uh, the subunits of the RNA polymerase. Um, the RNA polymerase is also binding the N-terminal side of NOSA, which is known. So this is a, a canonical uh, binding site. But then the uh, C-terminal side was binding to the 30S ribosome, which was very surprising, uh, as, as we showed from, the, um, as from what was known before. Now, your cross-linking data only gives you binary interactions. So it could be that the RNA polymerase binds um, NOSA, and then separately NOSA is binding the ribosome. So, to find out uh, if this is happening in one complex, we turn to um, our collaborators in, uh, um, in EMBL Heidelberg in the Mohammed lab. So they do um, uh, cryo-electron tomography and they did some tomogram of, the, um, of mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is so small and so thin, you don't actually need to fib mill it. So they were able to produce a giant data set because they never they didn't need any um, uh, to, to do any uh, lamella and they could, um, the nice thing about the ribosome is it's electron dense enough that you can just pick um, pick the ribosomes directly from this. So the median sample thickness of a cell is 150 at nanom nanometers, which is thick for um, for tomography, uh, thicker than you'd like. But um, but the benefits of not having to uh, fib mill this is were amazing. So they could they could um, collect 356 tomograms. So the data set was a thousand um, uh, um, uh, hundred thousand ribosomes. Uh, so then they did their um, subtomogram averaging. And uh, they, were able, they were able to find this class with this blob on top of the, the ribosome. And if they did um, more, uh, so it's quite flexible, this interaction. And if they did more uh, classification, they were able to get this, this class with almost 3,000 particles that had this quite close uh, interaction between the blob, which does look like the RNA polymerase attached to the ribosome. Um, so uh, the density overall was at about, uh, uh, was about nine angstroms. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the, the tomography because this was not my, um, my area and I don't have that much time. Um, but you could fit into this the, uh, a model of the, the, um, the ribosome and the RNA polymerase, but then you had additional, uh, additional um, unfilled densities. So we were able to go back to our cross-linking data, um, uh, data set and see where on the RNA polymerase these, dent, uh, these proteins were binding and to, to see if they represented these densities. And... Uh, uh, for instance, this is uh, SIG-A, which it binds in its canonical binding site, but that doesn't fit the density. So it, uh, it's mostly sticking out of the density. So we, we can, for instance, uh, exclude SIG-A. Um, and this is just showing the quality of the density of, with, the, um, with the RNA going through. So we, were pretty, we knew that this was an elongating um, uh, RNA polymerase. So what we're able to do then is take a few, the few proteins that we think could fit the density, which is NOS-G and NOS-A, um, uh, RPO delta, which is an RNA polymerase subunit that, uh, that is, is found in firmicutes and, and mycoplasma, so it's not in E. coli or places where the structures were known. Um, and then we, we turned to the integrative modeling platform by Andrea Sally, and we coarse grained, so we were able to fit the ribosome and the RNA polymerase, as you see in a second, and then we coarse grained all of the parts of the RNA polymerase that weren't in the structured region and also the uh, NOSA into its domains and NOSG into its, in, into its domains. And then you ask the uh, integrative uh, modeling platform to fit um, these, uh, um, these as best it can into the, to satisfy both the density and the cross links. And you do this thousands of times. 
So you here, as you see, your, your coarse grain, the, um, the, uh, the, the sequence into, uh, into these spheres. And uh, the spheres of, of, uh, can be of differing sizes from five angstroms up to 20 angstroms. You do this thousands of times, and then you get, uh, um, you get uh, localization probability density at the end. And this is the... Um, That's 14 and a half minutes. OK, this is the core, uh, the core density. And you see there's extra parts of the RNA polymerase uh, are um, sequences that weren't in the, the, the uh, that weren't structured before from the from the um, from the model. These fit out here, and then you fit, see NUS, G, uh, NUS A fits very very nicely into this uh, into this density between the RNA polymerase and the ribosome. Um, and and also you see the cross links are linked onto this. And we think the mRNA uh, mRNA goes through the uh, comes out of the um, the RNA polymerase runs along the RNA binding sites, so these, uh, these S1 and KH domains of, the, um, of, the, um, of uh, NOS-A, and then into the ribosome. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the model, as I've just discussed. Um, and then we had multi-body refinement to show how flexible this was. And then we were able to, um, to treat, the, uh, this, this, um, treat the cells with uh, with antibiotics, either to stop transcription or stop translation, and here with chloramphenicol that stops translation, the um, the because we could only pick the ribosome. You see, we we totally lost this density on top of the RNA, polymer, RNA polymerase. The ribosome probably stops, and the RNA polymerase runs on. And when we stopped um, transcription, the ribosome actually runs into the back of um, um, of the RNA polymerase. And we, inside the ribosome, we were able to look at the positions of the, um, of the, the tRNAs. And this was actually a, um, a pre-translocation state. So the RNA polymerase, or the ribosome, is, is stuck in the middle of translocation. So it's trying to pull on the mRNA, but it's stuck inside the, um, uh, but it's tethered inside the RNA polymerase. So this kind of gives an idea of what uh, um, these antibiotics could be doing inside, inside the cell. And it also helped us uh, show that our structure represented uh, um, uh, an actively elongating um, both transcription and tran um, transcription, uh, translation um, espresso. So that's, uh, so, sorry, it was such a, a whistle-stop tour, but uh, that's the end of my presentation. I just wanted to, um, to in particular, thank uh, uh, the um, uh, the group in, in, Heidel, in Heidelberg, so uh, Julia's group, and Liang, who did all the, the tomography, and in our lab in particular, Andrea, um, who did the um, computational modeling with IMP, which was a, a huge undertaking. Okay, thank you very much.